if um, I picked up on some loose threads. As I was coming into the building, I was approached by a young lady who wanted uh, really a clarification of something that I had said last week, and I think maybe I ought to uh, do some clarification before I move on. And then there is another request that was made in regard to black women in the Bible, and I thought maybe that I would do something in advance before I go into the lecture at the point where I left off last week. If I remember correctly what the young lady uh, raised as a question uh, that she wanted clarified, it had to do with whether or not I said that Ham was the father of black people. Um, now, in the reply that I'm going to give, it may be very uh, well that some of you will take offense at the way I'm going to answer the question. Well, not the way I'm going to answer it, but what I'm going to say. And given the answer, and I'm reminded of a seminar that was held in Chicago on uh, last February 4th on the black presence in the Bible. Uh, and I referred to Noah and Ham, Sham, and Japheth as being eponymous ancestors of three different groups of people. And there was a lady who got up, uh, and she had me to understand that she couldn't accept anything that had to do with eponymous, whatever eponymous meant, uh, and that uh, she believed that the Bible was literally historically true in every word, that when she was reading her Bible, everything she read represented actual historical persons and events. So there may be some of you who, who believe that, and that's what we have been, most of us, brought up to believe that uh, when we're reading anything in the Bible, we are reading all the time about actual historical persons and actual historical events without realizing that the Bible is composed of many kinds of literature. You've got, in the first place, prose, you've got poetry, and you know that you don't interpret poetry the same way you do prose. You've got fables, you have got history, you've got legend, you've got saga, you've got um, love songs, and on and on, many different kinds of literature. And you interpret literature according to its kind. Uh, and uh, often when I have been discussing a point such as this, I have referred to what I think is the ninth chapter of the book of Judges in which you've got a story in which the trees want a king. And they form a delegation to go around to the cedar of Lebanon, to the olive tree, to different plants, until finally they come to an old briar bush, and they ask each one of these to be king, and they are refused until they get to the old bramble bush, and he says, well, yes, I'll be honored to be your king. Now, whenever we read a story in which animals and inanimate objects act and talk like human beings, we call it what? A fable. Well, now, just because you're reading it in the Bible doesn't mean it has to be history there. But my late father-in-law believed. Yes, at one time in Bible times, as he had put it, trees were able to walk and they were able to talk and so on. So, um... Uh, uh, now, now, that's one thing that I would have clear. Now, up until a certain point in our Western civilization, we took the Bible to be the only history of mankind. And we took the story that the ancient Hebrew writers wrote on the basis of their knowledge, which as far as the world is concerned, took in only a little bit more than this map. Now, this map has got lands of the Bible today. The lands of the Bible go all the way from India in the east to Spain on the west, and then down to Ethiopia here and up here into Europe. That was the Bible world, and that's all the ancient biblical writers knew about the world. They knew nothing about the Western Hemisphere or even lower Africa and so on. And we've got to take what we learn in school and put it all together uh, so that we can evaluate what we're reading. Well, this is the world that the Bible writers knew about. And in that world, they saw three different groups of people. Japhites, they called them, Semites, and Hamites. And so, as ancient people do, 
Where did it come from? So you come up with what you may even think is history attributing all mankind to one ancestor who was Noah, who had three sons, and one of them was Ham, one was Shem, and one was Japheth. Now that's a good explanation as far as it goes, but now, what do you think about the origin of mankind today? Last week, if I remember correctly, there was a lady who asked me about the color of uh, Noah and Mrs. Noah. Did that happen here? Uh, and I, I told you how, up until just before the Civil War, white people who did all the thinking, or at least did all the talking about what the Bible meant, thought that Adam and Eve were white, that Noah and Mrs. Noah were white. Until finally, uh, Josiah Priest came up and said, no, white people have been wrong. And he was white. Adam and Eve were red. Everybody up until Noah and Mrs. Noah, including them, was red. And he proved it on the basis of the Hebrew word for Adam and for red. And that black folks and white folks came from a miracle that God performed in the womb of Mrs. Noah. Before that, there were no white folks, no black folks. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you're going to take all of this to be history, that's not a bad answer. <laughs> not bad at all. Now, today, on the basis of what you've been learning ever since kindergarten, mankind didn't come into existence, the different races, in that manner. But that is tradition. And the one thing, black folks as well as white folks have always believed on the basis of the Bible that black folks are descendants of Ham. And so last week, I put on the board those four descendants of Ham, Cush, which is Ethiopia, Mitzrayim, which is Egypt, Foot, which is perhaps Libya, if not Somaliland, and the land of Canaan. That was the Hebrew explanation. But that's not what you get out of your studies today, where mankind originally was one, originating in Africa, was black, and that other races, the Mongoloids and the Caucasoids, are offshoots from an original black race. But you see, that's accepted in scientific circles today. And a year ago, again, the cover of Newsweek had the original Adam and Eve black. Uh, I hope that that sort of explains, although some of you will continue to believe that when you read about Noah and the three sons, you're reading about actual historical events. Those were the views of the ancient Hebrew biblical writers. Other people had their ideas also. Now, um, for fear that time is going to run out on us, and I won't get to emphasize black women in, in antiquity, let's just go through what I did last week, starting with the first black woman that we put on the board, and then go all the way up to Jesus, and then you will have that for whatever reason you want it. But we started off assuming that Abraham and all of his folks originally were white. They no sooner get into the land of Canaan, which is here, than a famine drives them to Egypt, which we've defined as being uh, made up of black folks. And there Abraham got a maid by the name of Hagar. So uh, she would be the first one of these black women with whom we had contact. And then Hagar got for her son Ishmael, an Egyptian wife. We don't know what her name was, but it would be Ishmael's wife. As Kedar, which means exceedingly black. Then in the 38th chapter of the book of Genesis, we came up with a lady whose name is Bathsheba. She is not to be mistaken for Bathsheba. But she is the daughter of a man named Shua, and she marries Judah. And uh, they have three sons, and uh, the oldest boy marries a girl named Tamar. And we paid particular attention to Tamar because she, along with another lady who's going to get into the picture by the name of Rahab the harlot, uh, is going to be an ancestress of Jesus Christ. And of course, you read about these two women, not only in Genesis and in Joshua, but uh, in Luke and in Matthew in the New Testament, you have the genealogy of Jesus that traces his ancestry back through these two women. So that wherever you're reading about these folks, you are reading about black people. 
or black women. And then uh, after we had left uh, Rahab, we went on, and it may be we haven't gotten there yet, but anyway, uh, we'll deal with Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. Did we, we, did, did we look at her last week? Oh, well, then we'll be coming to her. And then also we have got the beautiful young lady, the most beautiful woman uh, who lived in all the land of Israel uh, by the name of Abishag uh, the Shunammite. And then we have got the queen of Sheba. And then we have got Solomon's Egyptian princess. And then when you get over into the history of the two kingdoms, Israel and Judah, you have got some women who enter into the picture, and uh, one of them is Jezebel. And just as we used to refer to ourselves as Aunt Hagar's children, it used to be when we ran into a bad woman in the community, we, we, re, we referred to her as, as Jezebel. <laughs> now, Jezebel had a daughter who was a spitting image of the mother. In fact, if you looked at them, you couldn't tell them apart. Does anybody know what Jezebel's daughter was named? Spitting image of her mother. <laughs> well, her name is Athaliah. Athaliah. Uh, now, most of the uh, persons we're going to have after this uh, in the Bible, as far as black personalities are concerned, uh, are going to be um, men. However, you know, I told you that a lot of things that people believe is in the Bible, a lot of things that we believe are in the Bible are not in there, then where do they come from? And I said that they come from the Talmud and what are called Midrashim. Uh, these are commentaries on passages in the Bible by the rabbis, and the rabbis make up all kinds of stories, like the Ham stories. And according to the um, rabbis, Rahab married Joshua, and uh, they became the ancestors of three outstanding persons in the Old Testament. Uh, one of them was Jeremiah, now, this isn't in the Bible. This is some of their tales. And another one was uh, Huldah. Does anybody know who Huldah was? You women like to study about female personalities in the Bible. Somebody in here ought to know who Huldah was. Oftentimes, women play a more important part than men. Uh, but apparently, even the women don't pay attention to this. But you read in 2 Kings about King Josiah who was having the temple repaired. And in the course of the repairs of the temple, a book was found. And nobody knew what that book was. Now living at that time was Jeremiah, a male prophet, but they didn't take it to him. In addition, there was a prophet who had begun to prophesy at the same time Jeremiah had, and he was black. Does anybody know who the black prophet was? Living in the days of Jeremiah might have been. Anybody remember from previous times? A black prophet called to preach the same year Jeremiah was. His name was Zephaniah. So you've got Zephaniah, and you've got Jeremiah, but they didn't go to the men. They went to hold of the prophetess. So you look that up in your uh, Bible, and if that's the case, then, being a descendant of Rahab, she would have to be included among these women. That's on the basis of the tales that the rabbis told. Then, of course, when we get into the New Testament, you've got such persons as Mary and the whole family of Jesus, as far as the women are concerned. Now, I know that someone will ask the question, well, now, why don't you have Ruth? in there. But Ruth is a Moabitess. She's not a Cushite. She's not an Egyptian, not Canaanite, and she's not a Footite. So that uh, Ruth, although she was to be sure, she's an ancestress of Jesus. You get that in the book of Ruth.
But that doesn't mean that she's to be included among these women here. Are there any questions further to ask about either the ham as the father of black folks or of these black women in the Old Testament, well, in the Bible? Here is Mary, and when you get to Luke and Matthew, you get, in one case, Jesus' ancestry through Joseph. You get it through Mary, but they belong to the same family. Both of them are of the, both of them are of the house and lineage of David. So when you go tracing this back, you always have to come to this woman and to this one. So that, uh, well, um, Tamar has the son Perez, and you're going to get Obed, Jesse, David, and right on through so that uh, there is where you get not only the family of Mary, but the family of Joseph as being a black family on the basis of our definitions of last week. All right, any other questions or comments before we go ahead? Well, all right, uh, it appears that last week we got as far as Solomon, I had been talking about David apparently, so we just looked at David's ancestry going all the way back to Judah and Tamar. And uh, so you follow through Obed, which is in Ruth, then Jesse, then Jesus. And uh, I indicated the last time that I gave lectures here that if you haven't done it, you ought to go to the library just to look at three huge volumes that have been produced within the last 15 years entitled The Image of the Black in Western Art. And uh, in uh, these volumes, you have got a sculpture, you've got paintings, you've got tapestries of all kinds depicting black people in Western art ever since the Egyptian Empire, going all the way back to 3,000 years before Jesus. And when it comes to the Middle Ages, in some of the churches, on tapestry, in stained glass windows and all, you have what is known as the tree of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. And always in uh, the trees, you've got one of these pictured as black. Well, again, you don't come up with black folks in a family tree without some black ancestors there. And in a case like this, not only ought they have one black, all of them ought to be Now, uh, most, most interestingly, oft times that one is indicated as being Uzziah. But I'm surprised that instead of its being Uzziah, it should be Hezekiah. Now, even before the Civil War, in fact, one of the first books that was ever published in this country by a black man was by Arbor B. Lewis, and it is entitled Light and Truth. Now, if you go to the Woodruff Library, you may find 10 copies of that, but the books are all falling apart and they haven't been taken care of. But anyway, those old black folks before the Civil War always thought that Isaiah was black. Why would they get the idea that uh, 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 Isaiah was black? It was because he was supposed to be a relative of King Hezekiah. Now, remember that in the kingdom of Judah, there was only one dynasty. All the kings belonged to the same family, and that was the family of David. So if David is black in any sense, or if Solomon is black, as we're going to get into it, not only one, but all of them would be this. But anyway, why Hezekiah instead of Uzziah? It's because Isaiah was supposed to be a relative of Hezekiah, but when we get to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1, we're going to learn or see that Zephaniah's father's name was Cushy, and Cushy means what? <laughs> the Ethiopian. And the ancestry is traced all the way back to somebody by that name. Now, it's very interesting to get your Bible commentaries, dictionaries, encyclopedia, and so on, and half of them will say, well, it's King Hezekiah, some just because he's black, don't want that to be so, so they'll say that it was some other Hezekiah. But um, so, so much for that. Now, leaving Solom uh, David and coming to Solomon, if you ask somebody to name black persons in the Bible about whom they already know, 
almost invariably in a group such as this, someone would come up with Solomon. And you ask them, well, now, where do you get that? And they will say, well, I get it from the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5. I am black and beautiful. But again, that's not a man talking. That's a young lady who's doing the talking, and Solomon is a man. So that it wouldn't be uh, quite right to associate that. But then on the basis of Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, and who is she? She is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And as you read about the divisions of the Canaanites who were supposed to be black, the Hittites are just one of those groups. So Solomon is black to his mother Bathsheba. But in addition to that, as we've seen, he is black also to his grandfather and his father. If you want to get uh, the ancestry there, he's of the house and lineage of David. Uh, that is um, Solomon. And that takes care of his mother Bathsheba, of uh, whom we know so very well. And did I put the name? Yeah, I know I did. Abishag on the board there a minute ago. Who is or was Abishag? If you will look in the Encyclopedia Britannica that came out in 1964 and look under that name, you will see an article done there by a fellow named Kofer. But, uh, <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> I think uh, all of you, uh, or at least some of you, because you've read your Bible, know about Abishag. But when you get to the latter part of 2 Samuel and get into 1 Kings, David is an old man who is very senile. And uh, his children are wondering how much longer he's going to live. In fact, Bathsheba's interested also because she wants her son Solomon to get the throne. Now, suppose you've got an old man my age, <laughs> and you're trying to figure out how much longer is he going to last. How would you go about finding out? <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't need to answer that. I, I, <laughs> I take you off the hook, but I, I can tell you what they did. And you read this in the Bible. Yes, David was a man after God's own heart. The, Bi the Bible tells you that. But one of his troubles was he's just always crazy about woman, women. In a way, he was worse than Solomon. So in the case of David, if you get an attractive young girl, old women and middle-aged women are no longer of much interest. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. And I refer you to the Bible for this. I'm not making this up. So they sent throughout the land of Egypt, uh, Israel, to find the loveliest young lady they could find. And it was a Shunammite, Abishai. Put her in the bed with David and look through peepholes to see what would happen. Well, if you're somebody my age and whatnot, you don't need to peep. <laughs> but anyway, they peep. <laughs> and when they saw that David had no interest, <laughs> they knew he was ready to go. <laughs> you know, uh, one reason you don't find the Bible more interesting than you do is you don't read it. But if you read it, and that gave them the notice that David is ready to die, then the children start fighting over the throne. And then you get these nasty stories of how Bathsheba and Nathan cooked up a plot 
and the boy who was to get the throne was named Adonijah. And he had his following, and they crowned Adonijah king, and then Bathsheba and Nathan went in and said to David in his senility, well, now, you know, David, you said you were going to give the throne to my son Solomon. That's Bathsheba doing the talking. And David says, yes, I do remember. And Adonijah is chased off the throne, and Solomon is crowned in his stead. But then read 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse chapter, uh, through chapter 20. And you get all these bad stories about David and the fighting that is going on. How one of the boys, Amnon, rapes his half-sister Tamar. Not the Tamar we had on the board, but his half-sister. Absalom is her whole brother. He kills that half-brother and on and on. These are the kinds of things that happen in connection with their deciding that David was ready to go. Well, all right, now here is Abishag. And we can't think of Abishag without thinking about the maiden in the Song of Solomon. Who is that young lady in the Song of Songs? I thought that we had dealt with that last week, but apparently this was in another group. We did talk about it. And someone said it was the Queen of Sheba. Yeah, I thought that we had done that, the Queen of Sheba. And some think it was Abishag. And some think it was... Uh, uh, the wife that um, Moses married, Moses' Cushite wife. Oh, by the way, I should have included her among the black women in the Bible. Moses' Cushite wife, Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. And then some think that it was uh, Solomon's Egyptian princess. So you get all of these answers. Uh, but because she's a Shunammite, some think that it is this girl here. It would hardly be a love song to Moses' Cushite wife. It could be uh, to the Queen of Sheba, and it could be Solomon's Egyptian princess. I have been particularly interested in her being Solomon's Egyptian princess because one of the church fathers living about 350 A.D., and I think I made mention of this last week, uh, indicated why Solomon had written the song praising her and it was to keep his father from getting mad because she didn't get the kind of reception she should have gotten by the young ladies in Jerusalem. But that is the maid in the Song of Song, whatever her identity might have been. And then doing this on a chronological basis, we've got the Queen of Sheba. Now most of the uh, commentaries and dictionaries and encyclopedia are going to have the Queen of Sheba coming from Southwest Arabia. But further investigation shows that the Queen of Sheba ruled over a kingdom that stretched across the Red Sea. It was in Africa and stretched into Southwest Arabia. But Josephus, who was a Jewish historian living in the time of Jesus and later, said that she was the Queen of Egypt and Ethiopia, and Ethiopia in ancient times lies directly south of Egypt and corresponds to what is now the uh, Sudan. And again, if you get those volumes on the image of the black in Western art, you can get to see the various paintings of the Queen of Sheba throughout the centuries. In some cases, she's depicted as black with blonde hair. In some instances, she's all white. In some, all black. But then in most of those in which she is all black, she is referred to as a temptress who seduced Solomon to worship idol gods. If you read the life of Solomon in 1 Kings chapters 1 through 11, Solomon in his old age was worse than David, and he began to worship idols. And some think that it was the Queen of Sheba who introduced uh, Solomon to the worship of idol gods. Now, on another hand, you've got all kinds of stories relating to the Queen of Sheba in Jewish, in Christian, and in um, Arabic uh, literature. So we could go on and spend two or three days just talking about uh, kinds of stories about the Queen of Sheba, how she heard about Solomon and traveled all the way up here to Jerusalem and um, had uh, an experience that was beyond anything that she had ever dreamed of. But one of the main things about the Queen of Sheba, and that was very common up until 1974, had to do with Solomon's relationship with her. 
and I gave Dr. Barbara four or five years ago a painting of the uh, Ethiopian uh, national epic. That is the story of the relationship between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, how she came to Jerusalem, how he seduced her. She became the father of the first king of that Solomonic or Davidic line, and his name was Menelik I. And up until that dynasty was overthrown in 1974, Haile Selassie, Haile Selassie and others traced their ancestry all the way back to that episode between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Are there any questions that anybody wants to raise now to any of this as we've gone along? Or any comments? Have I gone too fast or? Well, all right, if we may then leave um, this period, which is just before the division of the two Hebrew, of the Hebrew kingdom into Israel in the north and Judah in the south, we get into a lot of um, characters such as Jezebel and Athaliah, and they are living in the 800s. Jezebel, as you may remember, was a princess of Phoenicia. And there was a king of Israel, the northern kingdom, by the name of Omri, the father of Ahab. Ahab is a name that maybe you remember. So that Omri marries his son Ahab to Jezebel, and Jezebel is a worshiper of Baal, and she tries to institute her religion in Israel and to outlaw the worship of Yahweh, the Hebrew God. And so in the stories about Elijah the prophet, you get all of these stories about Jezebel, who was one of the most wicked women who ever lived, although she is referred to as the world's first missionary. She certainly was a missionary for her religion. And she tried to kill out all of the prophets of Yahweh, Jehovah, God. And it was in connection with that that she had the encounters with um, Elijah. And you may remember that her husband Ahab was a milk toast or a mouse, and she was a lion. If you really want a lady who knows how to get things done. And if you want to learn how to do illegal things legally, you, you read about how she went about doing things. For instance, Ahab had a summer palace up here in Jezreel, and uh, next door was a man by the name of Naboth who had a vineyard. And Ahab wanted this vineyard so badly that he could just die. Uh, but Naboth wouldn't sell it. So uh, he was pouting, and Jezebel saw him pouting and wanted to know what in the deuce is the matter with you now. He was always whimpering or something. Uh, <laughs> and maybe some of you women have got a husband just like that. <laughs> So uh, he, he lets her know what the situation is, and she calls him a jellyfish with no backbone. You read this in the, this is in 1 Kings. <laughs> and so she cooks up a way whereby you may get the vineyard legally. Does anybody remember what she did? Now, it's not to be sold. Naboth wouldn't sell it. It can't go out of the family. So if it can't get out of the family, and if there's no family member left, well, then it's going to go to the king. So how would you go about getting that vineyard? Yes, all right. And how, what would you have to do in order to get killed? What crime would you commit back here in these days that would make sure you got killed? No Treason. Treason. Why was Jesus killed? What crime did he commit? All right, blasphemy. Blasphemed against God. Now, Jezebel isn't even a worshiper of God. And you've got to watch people. They'll do things in God's name and don't even believe in God. <laughs> so Jezebel knows what the law is. So she gets two witnesses. And there again, you can get anybody to do anything if you pull out enough money. <laughs> this is sad, but she gets two fellows who testify that they heard Naboth blaspheme God. 
stone him to death. But you know one of the things about the Bible is, as in the case of David committing adultery with Bathsheba, it's always a prophet who comes up and says, God doesn't like ugly. That's what Nathan did with Bathsheba. So Elijah shows up and says that God was not pleased with what had happened. And just as the dogs had eaten the body of Naboth and his sons. Now that's something else. It wasn't enough to kill the father, but you killed the children also. So all of them were killed and the dogs ate the body and licked up the blood. And Elijah said that that was going to happen to everyone in Ahab's family. And so you know what the fate of Jezebel was. She was thrown off the balcony, and before her body hit the ground, the dogs had eaten her, and there she was. In the case of Ahab, he's shot in the army in the battle. His blood leaks out on the chariot, and when they get to washing the chariot with the blood in it, the dogs even lap up that, and everybody in that family ends up the same way. Uh, Jezebel, but then as I've said, Jezebel had a daughter that was a spitting image of the mother. And this daughter was married to the prince who was the uh, heir to the throne in Judah. And her son was killed by the man who killed Jezebel. And when she heard that her son, who was the king, was dead, she then got together all of her grand boys and had them murdered except one. And who can remember who the one baby boy was that got away? We don't know our Bible stories. When I was a little boy in the country, we had in our church what was called a Joash chest. Has anybody ever heard of such a thing? And we had that chest for doing church repairs, for a building fund. Joash chest. His name was Joash. <laughs> uh, his aunt snatched him away. He was a little baby in arms. And she kept him hidden until he was seven years old. And then they brought him out and proclaimed him king. And then they ended up killing the queen mother. Uh, but uh, here again, you've got a black lady who is the spitting image of her black mother, who was Jezebel. And that is Athaliah, who reigned in Judah and was the only woman ever to rule over the kingdom of Judah. Now, this brings us down to the 700s, and when we get to the 700s, uh, we get into a very interesting period as far as black people in the Bible are concerned. That's going to be from 799 down to 700. Now, living in those days was Isaiah the prophet. Now, in all of the prophetic books like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, even Zephaniah, you are going to read a great deal about Egypt and Ethiopia. And of course, in the Bible, you're always reading about the Canaanites. Now, in the Bible, you've got hundreds of references to God having brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, in addition to those hundreds of instances, Egypt is referred to 750 times in the books of the, the Bible. Ethiopia, 50 times. The Canaanites, something like 79 times. And the Phutites are referred to something like nine times. And most of these instances you will find in the prophetical books. The prophets are always saying something about Egypt and Ethiopia. And when you get to chapters 18, 19, 20, 30, and 31 of the book of Isaiah, uh, you read a great deal about uh, Egypt and Ethiopia, and again in chapters 36, 
Jude 39, which are historical. These are prophetic oracles. Uh, in chapter 19, well, open your Bibles, for instance, to uh, Isaiah chapter um, 18, and you will notice that here Isaiah has got a prophecy, Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth forth ambassadors by the sea, and so on. Uh, and look at what he says about that nation. Uh, that is the nation of ancient Ethiopia, and Isaiah is saying great things about them as far as their position in the world as being powerful. I call a special attention to such a chapter as that in which these Ethiopians are, in fact, the Ethiopians at that time are the greatest rulers in the biblical world. They are the rulers even of Egypt. And this is during the time of the ancient Ethiopian dynasty, when the Ethiopians ruled not only Ethiopia, but Egypt. Now, you go to these Bible commentaries and dictionaries and encyclopedia, and they will say derogatory things about black folks. But you need to know something about your ancient black history. The Ethiopians, instead of being hated and debased, living in the world that nobody knows anything about, just on the basis of a chapter such as this in Isaiah, is indicative of the position they held in the ancient world. Then you'll notice that chapter 19 is a prophecy against Egypt. This at the same time is when the Ethiopians are ruling, and although that prophecy is a prophecy of doom, when you get down to verse 18, you will notice a very positive prophecy that says that the Assyrians, who are over here in Mesopotamia, and the Egyptians are going to become worshipers of God along with Israel. They're all going to worship the same God. Now when you get to chapter 20, you will notice that the Isaiah gives another prophecy that has to do with Egypt and Ethiopia. In that chapter, he is depicted as going about naked and barefooted for three years as a prophecy that that's what's going to happen to the Ethiopians and the Egyptians and Judah who is trusting in the Ethiopians rather than in God is going to be ruined. And you move on until you get to chapters like 30 and 31 and here Isaiah is giving prophecies that uh, are against the Ethiopians and the Egyptians but again, they show you the important position militarily and politically of Ethiopia in those days. And so Isaiah says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and trust in chariots because there are many and in horses because they are strong and look not unto me, the Holy One of Israel. In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Well, so much for um, Isaiah. Isaiah is going to be next to the last of the prophets during the 700s. And for the next 75 years, there will be no prophetic voice in Judah. The Israelites have long since been gone as the 10 lost tribes. But then when we get into the 600s, we enter that period when prophets come on the scene again and the first one of these prophets to appear will be Zephaniah, and we've already referred to him. If you can find that book in your Bible, turn to chapter 1, verse 1, and there it is that you will see that his father's name is Cushi, which means the Negro or the Ethiopian, and the genealogy is traced back to somebody named Hezekiah. So that here we have got in our Bible prophecies by a prophet who was black beyond the shadow of a doubt. And uh, we need not take a great deal of time in dealing uh, with that except to just notice. Now, here is something else, however, to take into consideration. Many of your commentaries will say yes, 
His father was a Negro, and therefore he was black, and therefore they must have come from Africa. They must be Africans. But I contend that they are not Africans, they are native people of Judah. They are native Judahites. Remember that you've had black folks within the Hebrew population ever since the time of A Abraham and Hagar. And then again, as you read the story of the Exodus, there was a mixed multitude that went out from Egypt. And even in your universal Jewish encyclopedia, here you have Jewish writers trying to explain how is it that you've got black Jews among Jews. And they trace the origin of those black Jews back to the mixed multitude that went out of Egypt during the time of the Exodus. Now some of you might want to raise a question in regard to um, that uh, before it is all over with. But you've had blacks in the population going all the way back to the time of uh, Abraham, as I have indicated. Now, when we uh, move on, oh yes, by the way, I see that from my notes that I omitted a very important person in the time of Isaiah, and that is to hearken. Does anybody know who Taharka or Tirhaka was? Yes, uh, All right, uh, Tirhaka, you read about him in Isaiah and uh, in um, 2 Kings chapters 36 to 39. For instance, uh, Isaiah chapter 37 verse 9 and 2 Kings chapter 19 verse 9 you've got reference to this Ethiopian ruler who was coming to the aid of King Hezekiah who was being attacked by the Assyrians. And Tohaka is the pharaoh of the Ethiopian Egyptian dynasty in the period, uh, well, the Ethiopian dynasty was ruling from 715 down to 663 uh, to get your ancient black history uh, straightened out chronologically. Now, at the same time that we have got Zephaniah, there are several black people who are outstanding in that period of history. And that period of history is going to run from Zephaniah, who is 626, and we've got Zephaniah, we've got Jeremiah, we've got Holder, and uh, beginning in 593, we're going to have Ezekiel. And you're going to have the last uh, kings of Judah. 586, we'll see the end of it in the Babylonian exile. And in this period uh, here, you're going to have kings such as Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, uh, Zedekiah. Uh, they're all living during this time. And you read about uh, well, uh, Jeremiah, same year that Jeremiah was called to be a prophet, Zephaniah is called to be a prophet. But then other black folks are Jehud, well you've got Cushy, we had Cushy, did we? Zephaniah's father. But you've got another person by the name of Jehudi. And then we are going to come up with another one by the name of Ebed Melech. And the interesting thing to notice about Cushy, Jehudi, and Ebed Melech is that they are all officers in the court of the king of Judah. Now, some of them are black Judahites, but a person such as Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, you read about him in Jeremiah chapters 38 and 39. Uh, here are black Africans who are officers in the court of the kings of Judah. And I often refer to Ebed Melech as being the Henry Kissinger of the ancient world. Some of you may be old enough to remember Henry Kissinger and who he was. Now, Jehudi is listed as the great grandson of Cushy and he's referred to in Jeremiah chapter 36, 
verses 14 and 23. So now we have got three outstanding black folks here in the period 626 to 586. Jehudi. Now, who was Jehudi? You may remember from your reading the book of Jeremiah that Jeremiah had his secretary, Baruch, to write his prophecies down on a scroll. And someone went and read the scroll to the king, who was Jehoiakim, and as the person read the scroll, the king took a pocket knife, cut the scroll up, and threw it in the fire. Maybe some of you can remember. The man who read the scroll was Yehudi, the grandson of Cushi. So during this period, you've got a lot of black people in the Bible. Well, since time is running out, we'll skip on uh, to um, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, which is between 558 and 400. And you have uh, an enemy of um, Nehemiah by the name of Geshem, the Arab. And he is king of Kedar. Does anybody remember what I said about Kedar last week? means very, very black, and it refers to a tribe of Arabs here in the Arabian desert, and it is uh, such a group as this that accounts for such uh, creatures as black ravens having fed Elijah. Elijah, instead of having been fed by birds, was fed by black tribes in the desert of Arabia, and uh, Brother... Um, Elijah is here at the, this region here, south of the Dead Sea. Uh, and in the book of Nehemiah, Kedar, Geshem, is the king of Kedar, and he's one of the enemies of Jeremiah. We move on from then to the New Testament period, and we come to Joseph and Mary and their family, and have traced that family back all the way to Tamar uh, and Rahab. And of course, that gives us Jesus. And on the basis of the view that uh, Genesis chapter 10, which lists the sons of Ham, including the Canaanites, Jesus then would have been a colored man. Uh, we also have um, <coughs> the story of the Magi and I told you last week how a young lady had called me up uh, wondering why the black magi, or magus, I should say, was always younger than the others. I hadn't noticed that uh, in some of the paintings. It seems to me that Balthasar, the black one, is the oldest one. But she thought that there was a put-off uh, on him because he was younger. That meant he wasn't as wise as the others. I don't know where she had gotten an idea such as that. But a comment that I made to her is that in the Bible, you don't have three mentioned. You are told that wise men came from the east. And uh, I said to her that instead of just one being black, they would all be black. And if you've got an odd one, he would be white rather than uh, black. I mean, if you want to be uh, particular in uh, tracing where the uh, magi came from. Uh, then. Uh, when we talk about Jesus, you have to think about Simon of Cyrene. And a lot of people want to, they'd kill you. Uh, I heard a preacher <laughs> talking about Simon of Cyrene being black. Well, now, where do you get the idea that Simon of Cyrene was black? True it is that tradition has it he was, and I'm amazed at the number of white preachers and scholars who believe that Simon was black. And uh, I reminded, well, there is a book by Leslie Weatherhead entitled Personalities of the Passion. That means people who were associated with Jesus in his last days. And Simon of Cyrene, of course, was one. And in that book, Personalities of the Passion, Leslie Weatherhead, who was a great British preacher, has got a whole chapter devoted to Simon of Cyrene as black. And then I've got a newspaper clipping uh, from the Constitution many years ago, Billy Graham had preached a sermon, and he had said that Simon was black, and a white lady had written him a letter. In those days, Billy Graham had a syndicated column in the newspaper, and this woman just couldn't stand the thought that anybody as pardon as Simon Cyrene could be black. 
So Billy Graham had to write an explanation, and there's a newspaper clipping that I've got from the Constitution. And then, very interestingly, I came across another book in which a white minister argues that Simon was black. Now, in the black community, always we thought that he was black, and so County Cullen wrote the poem, Simon of Cyrene Speaks. They only put the cross on me because my skin was black. Well, there's no proof. He comes from Cyrene, and Cyrene is located over here in North Africa. But just because somebody is from North Africa doesn't mean that they were black. He could have been black or otherwise, but tradition has it that he was. When we come to Acts chapter 8, you've got uh, verses 26 through 38. The story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, who is the treasurer of Queen Kandaki, who's been all the way up to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, it so happened that last Sunday I preached a sermon in my church on this man, uh, and the title of my sermon was The Source of Joyous Living. As you read that story, this man, living 1,500 miles from Jerusalem, had gone all the way to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way back home, he's reading the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And uh, as he's reading, Philip the evangelist gets in the chariot with him and asks him, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I understand unless I have someone to instruct me? And he asks, is the prophet speaking of himself or is he speaking of somebody else? And he's reading those words, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, and so on. You've read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, and the Ethiopian is asking, is the prophet speaking about himself or about somebody else? And Philip says, he's speaking about Jesus. And then Philip tells him the story of Jesus. And he asks the man, can you believe? And the man believes with all his heart. And he asks to be baptized. And after he's baptized, the story is that Philip went on his way and the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. He had gone to Jerusalem and he had not found joy. He was reading his Bible on the way back home, still seeking happiness. And when Philip told him the story of Jesus, he found the joy. There is peace in my soul for which long I've sought since Jesus came into my heart. Well, that's the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And then in Acts chapter 13, 1, you read about a black man who is with the apostles and the teachers up here at Antioch in Syria, where the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. And his name is Simeon Niger. Simeon the black man. Well, now that gives you some idea of black people in the Bible going all the way back to Abraham and coming up through the book of Acts. Black people and personalities in and of the Bible. So we're now entertained any comments, criticisms, questions, or whatever you may have to raise. Now, this looks like the 750 times that Egypt is mentioned in the Bible and Ethiopia is mentioned. It seems as though that the, the book is really written on about the African continent. If, it, if Egypt and Ethiopia is mentioned, and Egypt and Ethiopia on the, on, on the continent of Africa, uh, those two countries are mentioned more than any other countries in the Bible. Well, at least Egypt is. And when you realize that at one time the Ethiopians were ruling Egypt, as in the book of Isaiah, when you say Egypt, you're also saying Ethiopia, that is true. Egypt is referred to more than any other country, even than the land of Canaan. Quite so. And another thing, you realize that the Hebrews, according to the book of Exodus, and also uh, kings, were in Egypt for more than 400 years and were laid out by Moses. And I've insisted, you see, that Moses and his family was black. I went through that last week. So that you're dealing with black folks all along, Moses' family was a black family not because he had married a Cushite woman, but because Moses' family is of Nubian black ancestry. So uh, again, you could say in a sense that uh, the Hebrews and the Hebrews' religion was African. 
Any other observations, comments? And you don't have to agree with me. Uh, in, in talking about the Hebrews, um, I know one, one of the, the uh, guys, Doc Ben, has said that there is a he, the Hebrews are Jews with an older heritage from Ethiopia than the Hebrew uh, Jews that we see now. Yes, all right. What is he talking about? How many of you are familiar with Dr. Yusuf Ben Yohanan? The star authorities in the area, and along with myself, and we will be meeting in Dallas the 28th, 29th, and 30th of this month dealing with a lot of this. Now, Dr. Ben is a native Ethiopian, a Falasha. Now, the Falashas are these black Jews that were in modern Ethiopia, going all the way back at least to 586 B.C. when Judah was destroyed. Now, Dr. Ben's contention is, oh, now, incidentally, again, and I didn't know what had happened until this week, I was reading a book that Dr. Ben has put out, and it has to do with um, the fight between white and black Jews. And he wrote the book because Jesse Jackson had apologized for referring to Jaime Town, and then Farrakhan had made some kind of apology. You see, Farrakhan is Muslim, Jesse is Christian, and Dr. Ben has forsaken his Jewish faith. But anyway, he, and he's got a chip on his shoulder, but <laughs> Dr. Ben is showing that neither Jesse nor Farrakhan needed to apologize for calling these white Jews Jaime, and Jaime Town, New York. His argument, oh yes, I was getting ready to say that back in 1974, Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, who was then at Fisk, do you know who Lincoln is? He's now at Duke, and he used to teach at Clark, and wrote this book, The Black Muslims, back around 1960. Well, Dr. Lincoln was at Fisk, and Dr. Mark Tannenbaum was chairman or head of the Jewish committee. And they sponsored a meeting between blacks and Jews. And it was at that time that I prepared and read this essay, Blacks and Jews in Historical Interaction. And I noticed that there was a big fight going on before I got there. I went up, read my lecture, and came on back to Atlanta. And I read about what had happened. It was a fight between white Jews and black Jews. And Dr. Ben is arguing, as the black Jews often do, that the white Jews you see now are not original Jews, but they are basically Europeans, Caucasians, Japhites, not Semites. That's the contention. But you've got to realize, uh, take what Dr. Ben says with a grain of salt, because he's got a battle to fight as a black Jew and the white Jews don't recognize them. But I would agree with Dr. Ben that being a philosopher from Ethiopia and black, he is more authentic a Jew than the Jews that you see in the main. That's what that's all about. Yeah, any other questions or comments? Points of disagreement? Well, I always like to have at least a tiny fight with somebody. <laughs> Well then, Dr. Barbara, I guess this is it. Hey, Doc, one more. Have you studied, what, what about your idea about the origin of religious belief? The origin of religious belief. Years ago, when I was in seminary, someone had made the statement that man is incurably religious. When did the first man begin to think in terms of religion? If you take the Bible, you are told that it was in the days of the grandson of Adam that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, now that is from the perspective of a Hebrew writer. But man is incurably religious, no matter how deep down to what we used to call primitive. We don't do it any longer. That's an insult. Man has worshipped God, and I often... Uh, when I'm talking about religion, refer to Longfellow's introduction to Hiawatha. And I, I loved uh, Longfellow, although he's got a typical white wasp attitude as far as Indians. You know, we used to call Indians savages. 
Uh, we don't use that kind of language anymore, but I do give Longfellow credit for this. Hiawatha, you know, was the Indian boy, and we used to have stories about Hiawatha and Minnetonka and all of that. But in his introduction to Hiawatha, Longfellow wrote, Ye whose hearts are young and simple, who believe in God and nature, who believe that every human heart is human, and that even in savage bosoms there are hoping, strivings, yearnings for the good they comprehend not, and that groping blindly in the darkness, touch God's right hand in the darkness, and are lifted up and strengthened. Listen to my simple story, to the song of Hiawatha. Have you seen Rodin's statue of the appeal to the great spirit, the Indian, on the horse, you know, the Indian chief? Can you deny that he is worshiping God? No. So man in his infancy has been religious. That's how I would, would answer that. Well, thank you. You've been such a wonderful group.